able to, this doctor discovered by using it on his geraniums. <laughs> this is uh, the earliest consumer model that I've been able to find. Uh, the the vibratoad is that thing that looks like a paper clip that's sticking out of the, uh, the sort of um, round device up there. This was battery operated. Um, and it was five dollars. And let me uh, in, in, give you a, a contrast here. The doctors were at this time charging two to three dollars a visit for these massage treatments. So by the time you'd been a couple of times, you know, you would have the price of one of these vibrators. This is a, a fascinating artifact of a very brief period of American history. This device right here is a very small water turbine. There was a period in American history when water was not metered. And, uh, and one of the reasons they started metering it was that people were using it as a power source. Uh, what she's got there is a, 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 a water turbine powered vibrator. Uh, these, of course, uh, disappeared. This kind of technology disappeared when, uh, when water meters appeared, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, just to show you a little bit of the context of vibrator advertising, this is uh, from a women's magazine. Uh, and you'll see here the monarch vibrator being used very chastely against her forehead. You still see vibrators ad advertised this way. Uh, but you notice what's next to it here. We've got um, uh, William Lee Howard on sex problems in, in um, worry and work. Um, although these were, as I say, fairly respectable. This one is the modern Priscilla, which I'll show you the cover of in a minute. This is, this, uh, all of you young men out here, this was a way to re recruit young men as traveling vibrator salesmen which must have been an interesting career. <laughs> uh, those of you who are engineers, are, I've probably already noticed that this device has an Edison plug. Uh, in order to use it, you had to unscrew the light bulb from its socket and just screw in the, uh, the vibrator. And of course, you, you know, you, it didn't matter that it, was, it would then be dark in the room. Uh, presumably, you could figure out where everything was located that you needed to find. This is one of my favorites. This is, again, a modern Priscilla, a needlework magazine. Uh, and you can't, this is, uh, you can see the uh, really kind of suggestive ad here where she's actually got it against a small of her back. Wow. Uh, but what is great about this is that in the fine print here, it says, thrilling, penetrating, invigorating, all the pleasures of youth will throb within you. <laughs> Which must have gotten a lot of people's attention. This is one of the ones uh, that was available at, the, at that period. This one was manufactured by General Electric. It's the one that's on the cover of my book. Uh, and it's in the Schenectady Museum, which is a very good place for electrical, doing research on electrical technology. Now, I, meant, I promised you a, 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 to, to show you an example of what was available from Sears. This was uh, 1918. And um, you know, these are, notice this is all for women. The idea here is um, you bought this home motor, and then you, you could buy these attachments for it, a beater, a mixer, a buffer grinder, a fan, a churn, and a vibrator. <laughs> so you were prepared for any contingency. This is just to give you an idea of just how respectable these magazines were. Now, vibrators were, were advertised in these magazines until they began to appear in stag films in the 20s. Uh, and that, at, a, at that point, doctors began dropping them from their arm, um, armamentarium, and also the, the respectable magazines stopped accepting advertising for them. So that we ended up with the situation that we now have. Um, but these are actual, you know, these, if you saw somebody reading this, I mean, it's, it's oh, you know, how, how virtuous, just sitting there reading about how to do needlework. And then you open it up and hear these ads for, vibrators and amenagogues and God knows what all else, including spouses. You could like order, uh, you, um, uh, you could buy a, ma a marriage arrangement through some of these in their, in their advertising. Um, mostly they were looking for you know, women for, for uh, sort of like a marriage market for men, but sometimes it was the women who were looking. Now the editorial content was often kind of sexy in a very downplayed way. Um, this was uh, one of the Hearst magazines, uh, and as you can see, the, uh, the pictures are a little startling, uh, at least for the time. And the fiction I've found quite interesting because it, there, there's a kind of soft core porn aspect to it. There's lots of, 
Uh, there, there's nothing with anyone's clothes off, but there's lots of, of uh, kissing by moonlight and really intense hand holding and uh, the kind of thing that if you didn't have anything else sexy to read would probably have you, send you running for your vibrator. I mentioned also that some of the other advertising would not now be considered acceptable. Uh, if you look up there in the upper right, you'll see a woman holding onto her head, and she says, late, end delay, and worry. Uh, and then it, it tells about this product which, quote, solves woman's most perplexing problem, unquote. Nobody, when this magazine was published, had to have it explained to them what woman's most perplexing problem was. Uh, and you could order this, this uh, mixture which would, um, bring on your period, uh, which is what the way they describe it, your, restore your cycle, or if you were pregnant, produce an abortion. Uh, this would, of course, now be illegal to sell. One of the other uh, sort of interesting sidelights on the history of the vibrator is that uh, even when they were being advertised in these respectable women's magazines, uh, there were some reservations about them, clearly. We have here a list of electrical appliances that were sold during 1926. This is from Electrical World magazine. And you'll notice that uh, there's a whole lot of things listed there, including some things that are now considered kind of disreputable, like violet ray outfits, uh, which are a quack, well, I don't know, probably a quack medical device. I don't know, maybe they worked on people who believed in them. <laughs> uh, but they, they, they basically just shown a purple light on you. That was what they did. But you notice vibrators are not listed here. So it's very difficult to find out how many of them were manufactured or how many of them were bought and what for, what people thought they were buying when they bought them. Uh, the vibrator kind of goes underground for a few decades, uh, from about 1930 to the mid-60s. And it appears only in, in uh, somewhat down market kinds of, of publications. Um, this, for example, is the Work Basket, which was a very cheap pulp needlework magazine. And you notice here that it's, now it's called a spot reducer, and we have a very noticeable abdominal emphasis here. Uh, we also have a, a vibrator that you could sit on. Uh, again, uh, reduce, relax, relieve uh, is the, the watchword here. Uh, and the idea was you're supposed to be making yourself beautiful by uh, using this device. And of course, there's no mention of anything, um, anything sexy. <laughs> now, this is. Um, this is actually a greeting card, and I, I usually close with this because this is the question that, um, that all of this raises about uh, and the, the androcentric model and women's sexuality and how much we are, are the, the very high price we are paying to hold on to this androcentric model uh, that, we are, that while we're continuing to promote um, coitus to male orgasm as the, the norm of sexuality, that half of the population does not find this all that satisfying. It might be time to do what this woman is suggesting in this, um, this greeting card. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's obvious what's happened here. The guy is lying on the bed, uh, and she is standing there, and she's got a chart, orgasms him, and there's a whole bunch, and then there's her, and there are not so many. And she says, honey, wake up. I think we have to have a talk. And that, I think, is the central message of, of all of this research that I've done, that uh, I think it's time for all of us to talk about the androcentric model and decide whether it's really worth keeping or not. Thank you.
to talk on this subject with Rebecca Hersick, uh, who is um, giving a paper on, on um, body hair <laughs> uh, in Prague with me. I'm, I'm going to talk about menstrual technology. She's going to talk about body hair. Um, it has something to do with women's, um, the women's bodies are not okay the way they are. And I think that's the connection. One of the points that, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful book by Thomas McCurr called Making Sex. Uh, and we talked about the, the male body as norm. Uh, Aristotle says that um, the female is a defective male. And uh, if you look at the history in which McCurr does of Gray's anatomy, the textbook Gray's anatomy, Gray's anatomy does not discover, as it were, the female skeleton of the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century. It's as if, well, the norm, normal skeleton is a male skeleton, right? So we won't put in the defective female skeleton, right? And it, it's as if the, the, somehow women are just not good enough to uh, have their own sexuality, have their own body hair, to have their own skeleton. That's the best I can do with that. Yes? I wanted to ask you about writing. You had mentioned Uh, he, yes, uh, both Galen and Hippocrates write about this treatment for hysteria that I mentioned, the massage treatment. Uh, and Galen says the reason that it works is that it releases these fluids which are penned up and causing all these problems. Uh, and Celsus quotes him. Uh, Galen is the, uh, Galen I think, he has a whole list of possible treatments. One of them is the horseback riding and uh, swings, he suggests. Um, anything that bounces a woman out of pelvis. Um, he, he's got he's got lots of various you know, things, and, but he, he starts by recommending marriage. Was he more sympathetic to a woman's point of view about? This? Not he. <laughs> no, the idea was she's causing trouble. You know, she's complaining, so <coughs> something should be done. They also thought that it was possible to get very ill, to become like you know, like really like fatal ill from hysteria. So they felt that it was their duty to do this. They, they were not, it, there was not something that, um, you do occasionally see a sympathetic attitude for women's orgasm. Anna Champ, for example, is very sympathetic. Uh, but not Galen. Galen is merely talking about, um, well, it's our duty to treat this because it's a female disorder. And, you know, she comes in with a complaint. Um, and of course, a lot of these people who are complaining, uh, the fact that they're complaining is a problem for their family. So they're being brought to the doctor. You know, this, my wife is complaining. Fix her. <laughs> sure. The other question I have about writing is um, whether or not you find or have you looked at any journals or diaries by women of turn of the century in America to see whether or not they even use the code word or the code. The code I haven't been really able to find them. Uh, I have looked um, and so far I haven't found them, but um, you know, I, I, I work in museums a lot and the amount of stuff that is in historical societies that no one knows about and no one has ever looked at because no one can find it, uh, it's just amazing. There are 48,000 historical agencies in the United States that all have collections. Half of them have no paid staff of any kind. So we don't even really know what's out there. And then there's stuff in Europe, you know. Uh, I think what will probably happen now that people know that there's something to be looked for is that that stuff will begin to come to light. Younger scholars will probably find it. Uh, you know, the Ishkabibble Historical Society, somebody will find a diary. There may also be stuff at the Kinsey Institute. They have, I don't know how many linear feet of sexual diaries of, by lots and lots of different people. Uh, at the time I was doing this research, the Kinsey Institute was closed for lack of funds. Um, so I, you know, I didn't get to see all that stuff, but I'm sure there's stuff there that is worth looking at. Yes? Uh, you mentioned Galen and the four humors. Uh, the fluid that's in the spinal cord was also a phlegmatic tumor. In fact, 
There were some doctors who believed that sperm was the fluid, a spinal cord, and if a man had too many orgasms in his life, he would just sort of pour a hole down. Because <laughs> he would use it all up. Unfortunately, you know. uh, that, that turned out to be true. But the idea was that uh, if Galen's theory was uh, the dominant one in medicine for uh, a frighteningly long period of time, uh, over a thousand years. Well, there were, there were a whole lot of different methods. It depended on what was wrong with them. In the case of hysteria, the idea was that there were these pent-up phlegmatic humors in the, in the abdomen, and you had to release them in the obvious way to produce this paroxysm. Uh, in the case of uh, people, one of, one of the sort of famous cases that uh, it, that people were still doing this at the turn of uh, the 19th and 20th century, uh, in, in the case of what they called apoplexy, what we now call a stroke, or in, in sometimes also in cases of heart attack, if people became very red in the face, uh, they suggested to the doctor that you had too much blood. So what they, would they do? They would they would use venesection to let some of the blood out, and that was supposedly and you know it, it may have helped some people, but there are all of people that it really didn't help them very much. Uh, one of the treatments for um, uh, for cholera was what they called tin and can, uh, a mixture of um, mercury and <laughs> which caused uh, massive, uh, uh, well, it was obviously poisonous, but it, it, it caused a kind of a, a dysenteric effect, which just seems like it would be lacking in meat and cholera. But people actually survived this treatment. Uh, Benjamin Rush used it, and he got cholera, took it himself, and um, he survived. So, and he treated yellow fever with it. I mean, he was, ah, it's amazing what that went through. The human body. Uh, they were, these were all sort of consistent with the, the Galenic model. Yeah, one of them, the yellow blood, had the symptom that if you had it, they had to do something. Yes, they all had, there was a whole array of, of symptoms. For every disease, there was uh, there was some set of humors that was supposed to be out of balance and destruction in the Galenic type for how to bring it back into balance. It's surprising that they didn't raise the survival. It is. You know, when you read medical history, it is amazing. It, it's really hard to believe that. Well, there's a lot of them, a lot of them did. <laughs> yes? Um, I guess I noticed that a modern vibrator does not look like the ones you showed, and it's more to do than just the battery. Um, like the ones now are more anatomically penetrating something. Is there? No, no, look at Dildo. Uh, okay. Oh, I promised, I promised you that I would give you the distinction, and I, and I didn't do it. Um, those are, there's, there's, there's a, uh, you're thinking of the ones that are, that are sort of penis shaped. Um, well, those are, are quite, those are popular, and you see them, a lot of them, uh, and they're called vibrators now. Uh, but the ones that are used for penetration are really vibrating dildos. Uh, the ones that you can buy in a drugstore and buy through mail order and so on um, are, are still shaped with the, the working surface at a right angle to the handle. That's the, that's the distinction, and they're, they're for external use. Uh, but you, you see, what you, when you see pictures of vibrators, people usually choose to, to put pictures of penis-shaped vibrators in, in um, pictures of vibrators because they're more visually stimulating, I guess. I mean, that's the difference. It's also kind of androcentric because they have... Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's the thing. Yeah. And in fact, that there are even, there are even uh, the person quoted in my book where it says, um, where it's, it's, it's these guys who are writing about them say, well, you know, women are using these because they don't have a man. And, you know, of course, yeah, many of them are probably used externally, even though they're, they're designed for internal use, they're used externally. Most of them, at least so I'm told by people who buy them. <laughs> Was by just denying, was 
that this is not our death. Uh, what would happen to her was an hysterical paroxysm had nothing to do with sexuality. Now, some of them obviously knew better and said so, but they were not the majority. Um, most of them said this is, you know, this is something that has to do with something else entirely. It uh, has to do with this disease, this crisis of disease. Uh, and so there, there wasn't any discussion, as you say, across these discourses. Um, and in fact, some doctors in the 19th century, a lot of them, actually denied that women could have orgasms uh, or any sexual feelings, uh, which was an even handier thing to say, because then it couldn't be any sexual going on in the doctor's office. Um, there was some, now when the vibrant began to appear in sad films in the 20s, uh, then it became very hard to pretend that this was not an orgasm occurring in the doctor's office. Uh, and I think also there was, um, during the, the latter years of the 19th century and the early years of this century, there was enough medical literature on sexuality appearing that began to be harder and harder for doctors to say that women didn't have orgasms and that they didn't have them this way. Uh, so that, although I have yet to find published discourses about it, the doctors just politely drop it. They just, you know, suddenly you don't have a vibrator in your office anymore. There's, but I haven't yet been, I've looked for it too. I've made a real search for it and it's not there. Except for um, abuse treatment in 1883, trying to tell his buddies that, that this is what's been going on and they, they just basically said, I want to hear it, I'm <laughs> Yes? Um, I came in too late and I, I could only uh, listen to the last 10 minutes of your talk. I should have thought that from the audience for that. But I got the impression Well, it's time we 
also been a tendency to say that you shouldn't have sex with different people. That maybe the fact that we have a lot of ethnic groups coming together within the last 200 years could have produced this mentality that you can't have sex with all the people, and that maybe was the remnant of it. Well, but unfortunately, the, the theory was here before the ethnic groups were. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, well, we had, we had, we had, we had Puritans. Um, and I, I don't really know. There's something going on in, in, um, in that has to do with Protestantism, I think. Um, but I'm not, enough, I'm not knowledgeable enough about the history of religion and the history of sexuality and the interface between them uh, to be able to really comment on it. But there, I think there's got to be something going on about that because there's, the, the discourse is all full of religious stuff and, and things about sin and the Ten Commandments and you know things like that. that I can't get very excited about those words. <laughs>